lives, people said. Amen.
up, Rich. All right. You may be seated. All right. And you got to sit right where you're at, too. You can't move around. You can't go back to your seat. You got to sit right where you're at. You see how that works. <laughs> it's kind of like musical chair. As soon as the music stops, you got to sit down wherever you're at. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, the closer you are to the preacher, the closer you are to God. In church. <laughs> so, uh, all right, ushers, as you're making your way forward, I do want to take this time, just a moment. This is Volunteer Appreciation Month, and uh, we've been acknowledging all of our volunteers by um, ministry, and this is our nursery ministry. We have a lot of volunteers who help out in our nursery ministry, and I'm going to read these off, and so if you would, if I read your name, would you please stand to your feet? Um, Christina Watson, Josh Watson, Skylar Watson, Pam Buckhalter, Brogan Buckhalter, Carrie Flanagan, Teresa Gardner, Jeanette Harris, Allison Johannes, she's in college, Debbie Kleiner, uh, Ashley Sadler, Amberly Sadler, they're in Children's Church, Lisa Steele, Lori Sundberg, Casey Swain, Tanya Thornton, Mariah Thompson, LaDonna Trout, Donna Weens, my wife, she's back there teaching, Emily Wilson, and Lisa Workman. Would you please give them a hand? Thank you. You may be seated. They probably have the toughest job of all. Amen. Jesus, amen. Um, I mean, they, they probably have the toughest job at all, of all, and, and uh, except for those who have to take care of the newborns, they got the easiest job of all, because they just hold there, and they sleep, you know, so, but, <laughs> not all of them, yeah, sure, um, but uh, thank you so much, all of you that participate in that, and I know they're still looking for workers, we're still needing workers, they're on a rotation basis, and so, um, the more that we have sign up, the less time that you have to rotate, and so, um, it just helps out so everybody can also be a part of big church. So again, thank you, nursery workers. You guys are awesome, awesome, awesome. So let's go before the Lord in prayer, asking God's blessing on the offering. Ron Kleiner, if you would, would you lead us in prayer, please? message of this next song because it's a song that has a lot to do with trust and trusting God. You know, the song starts out, you called me out upon the waters into the great unknown. And I think it kind of revisits that concept as we hit the bridge where it says, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. I don't know about you guys, but that's kind of a hard concept for me sometimes, the, uh, the concept of fully trusting God that he's just going to lead us and everything's going to be fine no matter you know the trials that we may go through so as we sing this next song really really pour out your heart and ask god to lead you and trust you in these coming weeks and really guide and direct your life so as the offering basket passes you would you stand with us
trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior.
All right, all the teenagers are dismissed at this time for class. All teenagers, you are dismissed at this time. For the rest of you that are here, I want to invite your attention to the book of Acts, chapter number 5. Acts 5. For those of you that may be new to the Bible, that's the New Testament. That's the fifth book of the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts, chapter number 5. We are just in the beginnings of a new series called Know Your Enemy, Four Common Tactics of Satan. And um, I'll be honest with you, man. I, I, please pray for me because this has probably been the hardest um, series so far that I've been trying to get together from distractions um, that happened to uh, my concentration um, to finding time. Uh, it's, it's been tough. Um, I don't know if uh, part of the concentration part has anything to do that tomorrow is opening season. I don't know, but could be, uh, but I doubt it. No, seriously, it's been tough this week, and, and um, I, I believe it's because of what I'm speaking on, and I know that the enemy would not want me to say what I'm going to say both today and for our following next three um, Sundays. So... But pray for me, if you would, um, as we continue in this series. Now, um, we have had a key verse that we have been looking at, and it's 1 Peter chapter 5. There we go, verse number 8. And this is what Peter said. He said, we have an enemy. Those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, those of us who are born again, Christians, we have an enemy. He's our enemy adversary. He is the devil. We talked about last Sunday, he has many names, Satan, Lucifer, the dragon, the beast, liar, and so many other names that he's known by. But we are going to use the reference as the word devil or the name devil and the name Satan in this series so not to as to confuse anybody. Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary. Now I want you to know that one of the greatest lies that I think the devil brings to the church, and that is that as a Christian, once you become born again, once you are saved, you have nothing to worry about. Once you are saved, it's almost like I've, I remember thinking, hearing someone say one time that, you know, the devil can't touch me. The devil's got nothing on me. He can't do anything to me. Listen, you keep believing that lie because I want you to understand, yes, Scripture says, greater is he that is in me than in he that is in the world, which is very true. But that does not mean that our adversary, the devil, will not come knocking at your door on a consistent basis. Peter said, we all have an adversary. We all have this individual that wants to see our utter ruin. Because Peter said, he's the devil. He walks about like a lion, like a roaring lion. He, he's, a, he's a predator. He, he's sneaky. And he says, seeking whom he may devour. The word devour in the Greek means to cause the complete and sudden destruction of someone to destroy or to ruin completely. Brothers and sisters, Christians, listen, make no mistake. The moment you got saved was the day you entered the battlefield. The day you received Christ was the day you entered battle. And the person you are fighting is not the person sitting next to you, and it's not the person out into the world, but it's Satan himself. For he is the one that is behind all of the attacks that we receive. So Peter says, be sober, be vigilant. Now throughout this series, we're going to see that Satan uses four tactics to bring about our ruin. They are temptation, accusation, deception, 
and manipulation. The devil will use those four means by which to bring about our utter ruin. Temptation, deception, accusation, and manipulation. Now today we're going to look at Satan's first tactic that he has in his arsenal, if you will, that he will try to use to destroy us. Now, these are nowhere in order because Satan doesn't try one tops and then go to the second one and the second one like they're in order. He uses them all at the same time. And we're going to look at today at manipulation. Manipulation. I don't think I have this. I don't think I put this in your notes. Um, if you do, great. But if you don't, you should write this down. The definition of manipulation is this. Exerting devious influence, and you ought to underline, and if you have a highlighter, highlight that word influence. Exerting devious influence over a person for your own advantage. Manipulation is exerting devious influence over a person for your own advantage. I want you to know today that Satan is in the business of manipulation. He will, he will do all he can to influence you to do his will. He will do all he can to bring about his evil desire in your life to produce his will, and he will use evil influence to do that. What is Satan's goal, by the way? Why, that's easy. Satan's goal is to turn all of us away from God, to take our attention off from the Father. His goal is for us to reject Him, or if He can just get us to not worship Him, if He can get us to just turn our focus or our attention or our love or our affection away from God and to Him or to the world or to the flesh. And so that's what He desires to do, and that's what He accomplishes many, many times. We see the manipulation of Satan in our text in Acts chapter number 5. So I want to look at this story, very familiar story to many of you. Um, but I want to look at what happened here and why. But I want to start back in Acts 4, just a couple of verses before verse 1. And look with me in verse number 32. Verse number 32. It says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart, and one soul. There was unity. So here's this body of believers, this church, the first church here, and they are unified, man. They are together. Their hearts are together. Their minds are together. They are focused on one thing. And notice it says, Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. In other words, they shared with one another. They shared with one another. In other words, it, it, when someone saw someone in need, they helped them. When they saw someone who was hurting, they embraced them. When they saw someone who was sick, they prayed for them. When they saw someone who was a newborn believer, they needed encouragement and discipleship. They did it. This group of believers were together. God was blessing. Man, this was a high time. This was an ultimate, ultimate place to be in this church. They were just on that high mountaintop. Everything was going great. Everything. Matter of fact, verse 33, it says, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. They preached Christ. They were exalting Christ. They were proclaiming Christ. Verse 34, nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need fantastic church 
Things are going great. Everything is like perfect the way a church should be. Matter of fact, verse 36, we have an illustration. And Barnabas, his name is Joseph, whose also name is Barnabas, by the apostles which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, Barnabas did this for the fact of he wanted to help. He had the right heart. He was in one accord. Now, before, let me just kind of hold off here and, and, and kind of just say something real quick because um, we can get the wrong idea that... Um, you could look at that text and say, well, Christianity is communism, uh, not communism, but um, socialism. You need to understand that they didn't sell everything they had and then distributed like everybody lived as paupers. But as God moved in their heart, they sold land. They sold extra. They, had, they sold what they had and was able to give to those who had need. And that's what they did in the first church. That's what churches still, still do today. There are people who still, even people in this church. Now, I've never had anybody lay land at my feet. If it's got deer on it, I'll take it. And I will distribute the meat to every, all the poor. <laughs> um, where was I? So <laughs> I just started, whoo, that would be awesome. Oh, yeah, in our church. So, um, <laughs> so we have that in our church. We've had people that have sacrificed financially, and I've seen it happen. And they've given to people who have nothing. I've seen people do it with vehicles. I have friends of mine that gave away their vehicle to a family in need, and they just gave it to them. Who does that? Christians do that. I've seen people hand people money who were down and out. I've seen people help people financially, physically with food and rent and light bills. I've seen it happen. And that goes on here at Lighthouse Bible Church. That happens. And that's awesome. That's awesome. And things were going great for this church. It was so awesome until chapter 5 hits. And don't you know... Because we're going to see Satan enters in the church in chapter 5. Don't you know when things are going great and, and, and the ministry is awesome, the Holy Spirit's blessing, everything's going great, that it seems like, bam, out of nowhere, here comes Satan. And then here comes the problems. Here comes the disruptions. Here comes the division. Here comes fractions. In verse number 1 of chapter 5, it says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also bearing aware, being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So this is what they did. They had a piece of land. They said, okay, we're going to sell this piece of land. Because they saw all the accolades that Barnabas got. They wanted the same accolades. We're going to see that here. And it says that, they bought a piece of land, but they kept back part of the price. In other words, they sold a piece of land for, let's say, 100 bucks, But they kept back 40 So they gave 60 to the church and laid it at the apostles' feet. The problem is, is that they told the apostles that they sold it for 60 When in reality, they sold it for 100 but kept back part of the price. Now, here's the thing we need to understand as we look at Scripture. There is nothing wrong for them to do that. There is nothing wrong for them keeping back part of the price. It was their land. It was their money. The problem is in what they did with it. The problem is, is the attitude and the person behind or the sin behind of what happened. Notice what happens with me. So they laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why, and here's the key verse we're going to look at, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, I'm just, I'm just going to stop right here and just say, 
Peter got some guts, man. I'm just saying. For Peter to say this in front of everybody, because this is a big church service, right? I mean, there's thousands of people here. And Ananias and Sapphira come up, and they lay that money at the apostles' feet, and Peter just looks at him and says, in front of everybody, Ananias, why have you let the devil enter your heart and lie to the Holy Spirit? I mean, that's confrontation. <laughs> I just don't know if I could do that. I'm just saying. I hope I could. <laughs> but I wouldn't know what your heart is anyways. Peter knew because the Holy Spirit told him. And he said, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit and kept back part of the price of the land for yourself? Notice what Peter says in verse 4. He said, while it remained, was it not your own? Everything was great. It was still yours. The money was yours. And after it was sold, was it not your, in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? What thing? What did Ananias conceive in his heart? Notice verse number 3, when Peter said, Why has Satan filled your heart? Satan was behind this lie. Ananias and Sapphira conceived it. Satan was behind it. He was manipulating influencing Ananias and Sapphira to do something according to his will or bring about his evil desires, and that is to lie. To turn the glory and worship off of God to themselves. Remember we read last Sunday why Satan fell? Who was he? He was the great music worship leader in heaven. And the Bible says in Isaiah because of the, or excuse me, in, uh, 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 yeah, Isaiah where he said, because of the abundance of your trading, you fell. And we know that in the Hebrew tongue, that means that Satan, Lucifer, this beautiful, the most beautiful thing we could ever imagine that God created took some of the worship that belonged to God and God said, I'll share my worship with no one. And God struck him down. And it seems like that's what Satan always does. He's like, okay, God, you're not going to let people worship me. I'm going to get them to not worship you. And so Ananias and Sapphira came and did this evil in front of the church to get glory upon themselves Instead of all the glory going to God. Did God get some of the glory? Sure he did. But does he deserve all of it? You bet. And so Ananias and Sapphira said, well, we're going to get some glory. They conceived this in verse number 2. They kept back part of the proceeds and his wife also being aware of it. And they schemed this up. They got this together and they go, this is what we'll do. They planned it out. And the whole time Satan is manipulating them and influencing them to do this thing. And by the way, on all accounts, Ananias and Sapphira were Christians, believers, members of the church. And so Peter said, while it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it still not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men. Notice who you lied to? God. He lied to God. And then something horrific happens. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last so great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young man, or excuse me, the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Now maybe they were their typical Christian couple. 
and they got into a fight on the way getting ready for church. <laughs> How many of you Christians do that? <laughs> Nobody's going to admit. Well, I'm going to church. You're not ready, honey. I'm leaving. Fine, you go without me. <laughs> Somebody's in trouble. No, but uh, <laughs> it says she came three hours later um, and she didn't even know what happened yet. Peter answered her. And, 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 you know, Peter didn't start off by going, now listen, you need to understand something. Before you speak, you need to know what's just transpired. He doesn't do that. Notice he says, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And I'm sure she grinned ear to ear. And she said, yes, we sure did for so much. You know what she was trying to get? Again, worship, glory, praise, honor. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look. The feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Now this is happening in front of the whole church. Verse 10. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things things. I'll bet fear came upon all who heard these things. Ananias and Sapphira were manipulated by Satan. They were influenced by the adversary, the devil. Why? How? Why did this happen? I mean, we're talking about two Christians. Why did this, how did this happen? How could two Christians be influenced by the devil? Even after we know Jesus teaches us in Matthew chapter number 6, Jesus even said, when you give your gifts, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. In other words, don't tell people. Just give. Don't sound an announcement but give secretly. Your heavenly Father who sees in secret will reward you openly, he says in Matthew 6. But what happened here? How did this happen? Now we've got to remember in our text, we've got to remember that when Satan comes to manipulate us, when he comes to manipulate us as Christians, you need to understand, Satan does not sound an alarm. Okay? Satan doesn't come up to us and go, hey dude, Listen, I'm about to do something to you, so just hang on. He doesn't do that. You know, a lion, when it's sneaking up on a prey, does not roar first, you know, like to alert the prey, I'm coming, right? He's sneaky. Anybody see Lion King? <laughs> and you don't see him until it's too late. Boom, and he's got you. You see, he never sounds an alarm. He doesn't announce his approach. He sneaks in without us even knowing it, and when he gets in, we sin. You see, Ananias and Sapphira had no idea that Satan was the one who had manipulated him to keep back part of the price. They didn't even know that. Now that's, that's clever. That's how good Satan is. That's how clever Satan is. Satan can manipulate us in a way that we don't even know he's behind it. But there is a way to know. And there is a way to guard ourselves from this happening. And how do we do that? How do we guard ourselves from being manipulated by Satan? Because after reading this text... Surely there's not a Christian alive that wants to be influenced by the devil. We don't want to bring about sin. We don't want to lie and 
be guilty of pride and greed and hypocrisy, which all of those could be sandwiched in with this text behind Sapphira and Ananias. But how do we guard ourselves against being manipulated by Satan? The answer is actually right here in our text. It's right here in the first four words. Peter said, your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking who may devour. Therefore, you have an enemy. He wants, to, he wants to ruin you completely. He wants to bring ultimate ruin to your life, to your walk with Christ. Therefore, four words, separated by a comma. One, be sober. Two, be vigilant. Be sober. What does that mean? To be sober means to be sober-minded. It means clear thinking. It means to be free from intoxicating influences. Now, I can relate to that because before I came to Christ, I used to drink a lot. And I know what it means to be intoxicated. And there are many of you here today that know what it means to be intoxicated because here's what happens. When you become intoxicated, you come under the influence of alcohol. That's why we, that when you get caught driving uh, with alcohol on your breath, um, you get your license taken away. It's called a DUI, driving under influence. The influence of what? Alcohol. Because alcohol has an effect on the human body where it does strange things. One, it dulls our senses. If you're hurting, you can... Uh, no. <laughs> I'm not saying do this, but <laughs> this is what alcohol will do. When you're in pain, it dulls the pain. But it also does something else. Alcohol, under the influence, causes our thinking to become blurred. What do I mean by that? When I would get drunk in my days before Jesus, I used to get what they would call beer muscles. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, one of you. Okay. For those of the rest of you that don't, have never drank before, I know who you are. But I was this skinny 165, skin and bones, 19-year-old, 21-year-old. <laughs> I started real younger than that, but, and I thought I could take on anybody. Why? Because the alcohol was lying to me and making me think I was badder than what I really was. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? How many times do you think I got whooped? <laughs> Never. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. No. Yeah, it happened. You see, being under the influence is something when you are, it, it messes you up. It turns you into something you weren't meant to be. It makes you think thoughts you shouldn't think. It makes you do things you shouldn't do and say things you wouldn't say. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And so, Peter says, now go back, be Sober. Be sober. Clear-minded. Right thinking. It's not being under the influence of intoxication. So, what is he saying when he says be sober? Here's what he's saying in your notes. Keep your mind right. Keep your mind, you want to keep from being manipulated by Satan, keep your mind right. 1 Peter 1.13 says, he, Peter also says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. 
Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. How do we do this? How do we keep our mind right? How do we keep our minds right? How do we keep it free from intoxicating influences? Two things. Number one, fill your mind with the Word of God. This is so important. We preach as preachers this so much that it becomes dull of hearing. What do we say? If you want to be victorious in Christian life, you need to read your Bible, pray, right? We do those things. Read your Bible, pray, come to church, right? But I want you to think about something. I... Um, let me see. How can I say this? I have a friend who struggles mentally. Struggles mentally in such a way that... Um, and they're a Christian. They struggle mentally in a way that they are under influences and all these things come into their head and we've talked many times and they go, man, I just can't, I, I think this and then I'm thinking this and then I'm thinking this and then I'm thinking this and it's all negative, negative, negative and evil, evil, evil. And here's what I told them. What you need to do is you must get into the Word of God and you've got to to allow the Word of God to get into your mind. How does that work, really? How does the Word of God get into your mind? It gets into our mind the same way when we go to school, and you remember when we had to memorize the, the uh, uh, not the Constitution, but the preamble? Well, yeah, but we also had, didn't you guys have to memorize the preamble? We the people, forget it. Okay. <laughs> when I was in school, we had to memorize the preamble. It was only a paragraph about, I don't know, it seemed like it was this long, but it was this, right? And what did we do? We took it home. We wrote it on a piece of paper, and we'd read it and read it and read it, and we'd like... Ah, oh, you know, we the people in order to form more perfect use step. And, you know, we'd put it to our mind. We'd put it and we'd memorize, memorize, memorize. We got it, we got it, we got it, got it, got it. Okay, teacher, I got it. I can say the preamble. Right? And you'd stand in front of the class. What did you do? No, no, no. <laughs> no. So, the example is you memorized it, right? You put it into your mind. It's what you focused on when you had to recite that in front of the class. Nothing else mattered. You were busy memorizing that preamble. It was just before your face all the time. That's all you thought about. That's all you looked at. Why? Because you know you had a certain grade that depended on that and you had to get that in your mind or you would fail. So nothing else mattered. TV didn't matter. Cartoons didn't matter. Well, some cartoons. <laughs> video games. Of course, there weren't video games when I was a kid. There weren't even computers until I was in... I, know, I was born in 66, so whenever computers were... Because I don't remember computers until I was like, I think 12 or 13 or something. Anyways... Where was I with that? <laughs> Memorizing. Oh, nothing else mattered. TV, cartoons, nothing. All you concentrated on was what you had to memorize. Why? Because it was important. Listen to me, Christians. This is important. And with this, when we pour this in our minds, you say, but Pastor, where do I start? Start in the book of Ezekiel. Chat, no, don't start. <laughs> start, start with John 3.16. Start with 1 John 3.1. 
Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Start with somewhere from verses that speak to you. Put them on a, what is it, a 4 by 5 or 3 by 5 whatever those index cards are. Put it on there, write it out, and let nothing else matter except pouring that into your head until you get some verses in your mind. Why? Because if you're going to keep your mind right, you have to fill your mind with the Word of God so that you can counteract the words of Satan. You say, but pastor, what verse is it that I got to quote because I'm dealing with this? It doesn't matter. Because all of God's word is powerful. You know what I do when, I'm, when, when Satan is trying to manipulate me and he's trying to test me and deceive me? You know what? I just quote John 3, 16. You say, but, and I know part of me is going, but Tim, that has nothing to do with what you're thinking about. And then I have an argument with myself. And I'll go, but Tim, it doesn't matter. It's the word of God. And then I'll start quoting out loud. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. In your face, right? <laughs> Talking to the devil. And from that, from that, the thoughts go away. I'm telling you guys, listen, this is truth. This works. This is not some potion mumbo jumbo. This is the word of God that will last forever, that has authority and when you pour this in your mind when you fill your mind with the word of God thank you Lord what did David say your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you your word have I hid your word have I memorized in my mind and it's reached my heart so that I will not sin that's how powerful it is. Ephesians 4.23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Of course, you know Romans 12.2. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind constantly. We, as Christians, have to constantly renew our minds. Why? Because Satan's never going to give up. And he's going to try and try and try and try and try to attack us. We must constantly fill our minds with the Word of God. Colossians 3.16, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, richly in all wisdom. So keep your mind right. You need to fill your mind with the Word of God. Number two, if you will allow me to work this in here because this is really good. Fill your heart with the Holy Spirit. Fill your heart with the Holy Spirit. Listen, in verse number 3 of our text, it says, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled, filled, the word filled in the Greek? I'm probably going to say this wrong because I don't speak Greek. But I see it on my study guides that I use and all of my material. And I can read, I can, I have the Greek New Testament, I have the Hebrew Old Testament, I have... I have several, I have every translation of the Bible that was ever written. And so I can look up every single word in the Greek and in the Hebrew. Um, and I can find the definition and find out how to translate the text, how to keep everything into context, and how to bring about what God is trying to tell us, to, what he's telling us here in the text. But the word filled is amazing. Because the word filled means... To cause someone to think in a particular manner, often as a means of inducing some behavior. To make think, to fill the heart, to cause to decide. Peter said, why has Satan filled? Why has Satan made you think? Why has Satan caused you? Why has Satan influenced you? Influence your heart. That same word filled is the same word that's in Ephesians. And do not be drunk with wine. 
Do not be intoxicated with wine, which is dissipation, but be, there it is again, same Greek word, same Greek root word. I believe it's pronounced paleo, but I'm probably wrong. But be filled with the Spirit, capitalized. Who is that referring to? The Holy Spirit. In verse 3 of our text, Peter says, Satan has influenced your heart. In Ephesians, Paul said that the Holy Spirit ought to influence us. You see, if we're going to keep our minds right, we can't just fill our minds with the Word of God, but we also must fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit. And that means we must be led by the Holy Spirit. We must allow the Holy Spirit to influence us. The more of the Word of God that you pour into your mind, the more the Holy Spirit can influence you and lead you. I'll say that again. The more of the Word of God that you pour into your mind, the more the Holy Spirit can influence you and lead you as a Christian. It will never happen apart from the Word of God. It will never happen apart from the Word of God. We must fill our minds with the Word and be influenced by the Holy Spirit so we can keep our minds right so that we can, in our text, be sober. Why? Because our adversary is trying to bring about our ruin. Number two, last point. Wow, time is getting away. Number two, keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open. You want to know how to keep from being manipulated by Satan? He says, be vigilant. Be vigilant. To be vigilant means to be watchful. It means to be alert. This means, listen, this means that we should exercise careful circumspection as one does when he is in danger. You ever watch on the National Geographic Channel or Discovery Channel, excuse me, and how they show um, predators and What's the, peop what's the animals they chase? Predators? Prey. <laughs> predators. Predators and predators. Sounds right. Prey. 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 So you ever see the prey? You got a gazelle or whatever they are? Antelopes? I don't know. Whatever they all chasing after. Wildebeest. And they're going down to the water. And they go down a little bit, drink up, and they come up. And they go down. Drink a little bit more. Come up. You ever see them do that? Deer do that all the time. And then deer fake you out, right? Rich, you're a hunter, so you know deer fake you out. Kevin, you know, like a, like a doe or buck, they'll go down like they're going to eat, and they go, they fake you out. They know, they think you're there, so they kind of go down, and then jump up real back. Like, did anybody move? You know what I'm talking about? They fake you out. They're going to like go down and try to eat something. They don't even go down to eat. They're just going, I'm going to fake them out, make them move. Boop, comes back up. Circumspectly. Always knowing there's danger. Always looking around. Always being on alert. That's what mean, being vigilant means. Be vigilant. Be always on alert. Always circumspect. Always knowing that you are in danger. It's staying awake. Being watchful. You see, the problem with Ananias and Sapphira, I believe, was they became relaxed. They became comfortable. You know, that's easy to do in the Christian life, isn't it? Things are going great. Life is grand. Money's in the bank. Kids are doing well. Church is great. Everything is great. And we can become relaxed. Comfortable. We get so comfortable and relaxed where we go, wow, Sunday's here. Gosh, it's nice. You know what? Why don't we just stay home today? You know, we've been going to that Bible study for quite some time. I think it's time that 
we just take a break from the Bible. We become so comfortable and relaxed that we just kind of become nonchalant with what is so important to the Christian walk. What did Jesus say? Without me you can do nothing. Abide in me and I in you. Listen, I, I think the problem with Ananias and Sapphira was they, they just became relaxed. They became comfortable. And in that comfortability, if that's even a word, Satan was manipulating them from the beginning and they didn't even know it. And he was influencing them as they were going, wow, we have all this land, you know, we could sell it for a hundred, or uh, yeah, sell it for a hundred, keep back forty, and tell the church we sold it for sixty, and why not? We deserve it, don't we? Can't we do that? Isn't it our place to be able to do that anyways? And so Satan manipulated them. They didn't stay watchful and alert to the schemes of the devil. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, I'll close with this. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Be sober. I'm going to read one text, Romans. Um, I don't know if I have that in your notes or not. Romans chapter 13. Um, listen to what Paul says. This is a great, great picture of being sober, being vigilant. <clears throat> In Romans 13, verse number 11, Paul says this. He says, And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Father, there is no doubt that the enemy that we face is strong, cunning, sly, smart, and powerful. So much so, Lord, that he can even deceive Christians. He manipulates us when we are not watching. He manipulates us, influences us when we are not being alert to the danger which is Him. We become manipulated when we don't keep our minds right. Clear thinking, saturated with the Word of God. Father, help us as believers to remember these things. To not fall like Ananias and Sapphira did. To not fall to the schemes of the evil one. But God, remind us to stay in your word. Even if we don't understand everything, just help us to still get into your word. Help us to get helps, whether it be devotional booklets, calling the pastor, Pastor, what does this mean? What does this text say? How do I apply this to my life? God, I pray that they will get into your word. Even me, Lord. Because the biggest person that would be, that the devil would love to manipulate is me. He would love to see me fall. And Father, I pray for your protection. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill me, but not just me, but these people as well. And help us, help us to walk in the Spirit. Help us, Lord, to be true to Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Father.
We love you. We praise you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. I am so glad you came today. I pray that you will stick around for this series. Um, I believe this is very important that we all hear this and understand this. Um, because we are at war. We are at war as Christians against an unseen enemy. But I want you to know that that unseen enemy is working through the world in a big way. You look at the news, you see it. We need to be on our knees praying. 